Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the October National um, MBS Pilot Webinar hosted by the MBS CRN. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. I just want to remind everybody, this is an open, these calls are recorded. It is an open forum call. Um, so just please, please be respectful and mute yourself while the speaker is speaking, but feel free to unmute yourself if you have any questions or comments that you would like to add. And this um, call will be available on the MBS CRN website, as well as our YouTube channel after it is over. So the agenda for today, is we will hear two presentations, um, one from Dr. Roshini Abraham, and the second presentation that will be continued from our network meeting, Dr. Sander Houghton. And um, then if we'll have updates from APHL as well as MBS Tran. Um, so with that said, I would like to first introduce um, Dr. Roshini Abraham um, on her presentation, Efforts to Harmonize NBS SCID nomenclature and terminology. Uh, email them. Hello? Okay. Um, Joe, I'm going to mute you. Okay, so a collaborative project between APHL, CLSI, and CIS. Um, Dr. Abraham received her PhD in immunology and sub subsequently um, completed postdoctoral um, fellowships in immunology and um, Clinical Immunology Biochemistry at the Mayo Clinic. She was a faculty at Mayo Clinic um, between 2002 and 2018, where she was the professor of Medi medicine in laboratory medicine um, pathology. Since then, she joined the National Nationwide Children's Hospital in the Department of Pathology Laboratory Medicine, Columbus, Ohio, as an um, Associate Chief of Academic Affairs and Founding Director of the Diagnostic Immunology Laboratory. She's also Professor of Clinical Pathology at Ohio State University, um, Wexner College of Medicine, and she is a diplomat of the American Board of Medical Laboratory Immunology and fellow of the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology and the Clinical uh, Immunology Society and a past president of the Clinical Immunology Society. She has published close to 300 articles, review um, articles, books, and book chapters and abstracts. And with that, I will hand it over to um, Dr. Abraham. Um, let me know if you can still share your screen. Yes, thank you very much, <clears throat> Jennifer, for that introduction. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Oh, thank you so much. Okay. Uh, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with this brief again um, and to just introduce you to this uh, topic that we've been working on for the last few months, and that's to sort of harmonize terminology and uh, reports uh, related to newborn screening for SCID. Um, all of you might have seen an email come through the new steps, APHL Jalili yesterday or the day before regarding a survey, and I'll talk about that a little bit more towards the end. Uh, just by way of laying a foundation for our discussion this afternoon, just a reminder that we've had TREC newborn screening, TREC-based newborn screening for SCIDS for um, over a decade or so, and now the entire United States does a screen for uh, skid uh, using this methodology, as well as a number of regions and countries around the globe. And uh, the original condition for which uh, the newborn screening uh, for skid was approved was for the group of disorders that we call severe combined immunodeficiency. And we have a few. Uh, Sorry, does anybody say something? Okay. Um, uh, so just by way of reminder, when the original yep. definition for excellent conditions, um, I'm getting a bit of feedback. I don't know. Um, uh, could I request that you mute your microphones if you're not uh, speaking, please? Thank you. Uh, so 
the uh, original target of the newborn screening for SCID was, you know, all the conditions that are grouped under this term of severe combined immunodeficiency. And we have a few flavors. We have what we call typical SCID, leaky SCID, which refers to hypomorphic forms uh, of the same genes that are associated with typical SCID and Omen syndrome, where there are other clinical features associated. So all of those form the primary target. But as we have seen, we do pick up other conditions besides SCID uh, on this trek based screening, and that includes syndromic disorders where there's T-cell lymphopenia, secondary conditions which uh, cause low T-cells, prematurity, and then what we call idiopathic T-cell lymphopenia where there's no sort of discernible cause. All of you must be familiar with CLSI, which as you know, is a organization that publishes guidelines related to various laboratory methodology and disciplines. And the first CLSI guideline related to newborn screening for SCID using the TREC assay came out almost close to a decade ago in April 2013. And uh, since 2019, we've been working on uh, a revision of this guideline where we are summarizing the advances that have happened in this intervening time period, as well as uh, the status for global newborn screening for SCID, any updates in TREC methodology, uh, any issues related to multiplex screening, um, and then discussing the question about whether adding CRIC as a marker for severe B cell immunodeficiency would be worthwhile uh, in terms of incorporating a newborn screening for skin. And then this is really what we're going to focus on today, and that is the harmonization of reporting and interpretation practices. And then we also touch upon some guidelines for follow up and confirmatory testing for skin. Uh, due to COVID and a variety of other factors that are actually out of our control. This document, which should have been published in 2021, is now more likely to be published in 2023, and we hope to make it available for public comment by the end of the year. And so there are several uh, groups represented, including immunologists, newborn screening individuals, industry partners, etc. Now, uh, earlier this year, there was a paper in the Journal of Allergy and Clinical Immunology from a group of immunologists both in North America and in Europe uh, discussing some of the issues that immunologists particularly find challenging with newborn TREC newborn screening reports. And that is just the proliferation of terminology, which is trying to say the same thing, but using a variety of terms to say that. So for example, from the paper, they did a capture from literature for all the terms that are used to report an abnormal TREC result from newborn screening from a dried blood spot and where it needs to be reanalyzed. So you can see that, you know, there's just a plethora of terms that one could use uh, when one is still trying to say the same thing. And similarly, uh, when they looked through the literature for terms that are used where some sort of action is required after an initial uh, TREC screen from a dried blood spot, again, there's just a multiplicity of terms. And it's often confusing to the immunologist who's trying to determine you know, what this term means exactly. And if A says that and B says that, are they both saying the same thing or so using uh, different uh, sort of interpretation? So uh, this group, um, you know, postulated that it would be useful, particularly for the clinicians and the immunologists, if there was some sort of harmonization and uh, some sort of uniformity in the definition for newborn screening for skid. Um, and so on the left-hand side, you can see that these are some of the terminology or terms or uh, how these reports are, uh, you know, sent out to the clinicians. And here are some suggestions from this particular group. And this is obviously not a global consensus, but a few experts who've come together to look through the literature and offer their expertise. And uh, so as you can see, when 
space, absent checks, they would like to have some sort of urgent or imperative or some sort of word that indicates urgency. And then uh, if it's not absent, but it's slow, you know, to use the word abnormal, so that the clinician can get a sense of, you know, is there something urgent, clinically a skid that I need to deal with at five o'clock on a Friday evening, or is it something that's slow that I can handle on a Monday morning? And same thing, you know, if you've got a normal result, how, what sort of word can you use that would be with that equivocation and ambiguity uh, for the clinician? And then if there's an analytical DNA amplification failure, what sort of terminology should one use? And so they go on and offer some different suggestions. And so we created this harmonization committee, which at the end you'll see it's sort of got newborn screeners and immunologists represented. We're trying to partner with the newborn screening community to ensure that the needs of the newborn screening program is served, but that also the immunologists who have to follow up on these cases are also served uh, by using the right terminology. Now, uh, for those of you not familiar with the immunology uh, classification, every two years, the International Union of Immunological Societies, or IUIS, puts forth a document, and there are about 485 total disorders or inborn errors of immunity. And the first two tables of that document include SCIDs and combined immunodeficiency. And as you can see in category one, which includes SCIDs and atypical or leaky SCID, there are about 43 genetic defects that include many of our well-known culprits. And then there's a second category where the thymic defects that are associated with thymic um, stromal or functional defects are separated from the skid or the atypical leaky skid. And then there's a third category where it's skid-like, but the defect is non-hematophytic stem cell in origin, for example, certain enzymatic or other cellular pathways. And then a fourth category, which really includes a lot of the syndromic disorders where T-cell lymphopenia can be observed. So the the recommendation, if you will, from the uh, group of experts that put together the Blom paper suggested that categories one, two, and three are the groups where you would be more likely to see these urgent low or low tracks. And I'll talk about the Primary Immunodeficiency Treatment Consortium or PIDTC skid definition, which is actually being updated in 2022. The other thing to note is that certain disorders that are picked up with low check on newborn screening are syndromic disorders or combined immunodeficiencies. And in some patients, you may see low check, and in other cases, you may see normal check. So prior to newborn screening, you know, we had a clinical definition and a laboratory definition for SCID. And then once newborn screening came along, this was the original PIDTC recommendation, which used 300 T cells or less as the cutoff. Now, the latest 2022 revised PIDTC criteria actually has dropped this to 50 T cells per microliter. And that paper has been submitted and is currently under review. And so these criteria that I've put here in italics um, we're based on the 2014 PIDTC, PIDTC criteria, but these are going to change in 2022. And so, uh, you know, we need to be on the lookout for the new criteria. It still has these cutoffs or these categories of difficult skid, leaky skid, omen syndrome, and what are the diagnostic criteria, including T cell counts, looking for maternal engraftment, looking for other laboratory parameters besides low check. Now, we also recognize that, as I mentioned in the second slide of my presentation, that we do pick up conditions other than SCID. And some of these are listed here, where you have syndromic disorders or secondary causes of T-cell lymphopenia, prematurity or idiopathic T-cell lymphopenia. So the Blom group of experts in the Blom paper got together and offered some suggestions 
uh, that based on earlier data, how they were classified and how they probably should be classified uh, for the sake of uniformity and ease of understanding going forward, that we use the 2022 criteria for the diagnostic classification of SCID, leaky SCID, atypical SCID, omen syndrome that we have a separate, a separate category for non-skid disorders where we do CT cell lymphopenia. We have a yet another category within that for syndromic disorders like ataxia, telangiectasia, et cetera, where you can see um, low T cells and low TREC. And then secondary disorders uh, with, associated with T cell lymphopenia and then where the etiology is unknown goes into this category. Now, obviously, this is a, a terminology or a sort of classification that's been proposed by a group of immunologists, and it really hasn't been tested broadly in the immunology community quite as yet. And then the category of patients who have prematurity or low birth weight, you know, fall into this sort of terminology where it is very clear and self-evident as to what this means. And then, of course, the, all the false positives who have normal uh, T-cell counts and naive in memory T-cells by flow cytometry are here. And then, of course, patients who've got inconclusive results where they've not had further confirmation by flow cytometry due to one or the other reason. And so in our CLSI document, which we are currently working on, and I mentioned would hopefully okay. be published next year, we've come up with an algorithm where we treat term versus preterm or low birth weight infants sort of separately. If they, if they are term and they have low TREC, you know, we recommend what we would like to see for confirmatory uh, flow cytometric analysis as a first year of testing. And if that's normal, you don't do anything further. If it's abnormal, you continue your investigations, including genetic testing. If there's an infant in the NICU, whether they're term or uh, low birth weight, uh, and if the trek is undetectable, then, you know, we would consider these to be the urgent cases. And if it's a Friday evening after five o'clock, it doesn't matter. The immunology laboratories where this sort of testing is done should be alerted and proceed with testing ASAP. And then if you've got these NICU preterm or low birth weight and they have low trek, you know, then you have this sort of repeat algorithm and then uh, you know, doing flow cytometry a little bit further down the road and following that process. Now, there wasn't a whole lot of consensus about what sort of testing should be done as confirmatory testing for uh, once flow cytometry is sent after an abnormal TREC result. Most people were doing CBC and differential and basic lymphocyte subset quantitation. And some in the groups were doing this naive in memory T cell quantitation with or without recent thymic emigrants as either part of tier one or as a second tier. So what we have advocated in the new CLSI guidelines is that all of this be done as a first tier. That is naive in memory T cell quantitation with or without assessment of recent thymic emigrants should be a first tier. And then if there's concern for SCIDs, you know, then as appropriate, repeat that, also do maternal engraftment assessment, genetic testing. And then of course, based on the individual clinical case, other ancillary testing may be required. In our CLSI document, we've also uh, offered a SWOT analysis of our trek based newborn screening for SCIDs. And I think this is where I just wanted to focus for the purpose of our discussion and the survey that was sent out is that we have an opportunity now a decade or so into newborn screening for SCIDs is to build consensus. You know, we've got over some of the initial hurdles of establishing trek based screening. So now's the time with the experience that we have to build consensus in our immunology community, as well as with the public health testing personnel in terms of creating standard definitions for terminology, classification of results, reporting of results, etc. And 
uh, it is a threat if we don't attempt uh, to harmonize some of that, because sometimes we're not speaking the same language. We might be using the same words, but meaning different things. And is there an opportunity for us to improve that so that everybody's reports have a certain amount of uniformity and that we mean what these words say and that others can understand without requiring additional clarification. So that was sort of the impetus to create this joint initiative. And of course, uh, as immunologists, we have to partner with our public health colleagues in the newborn screening labs. So this is an effort to work with, bring these two groups together. And since CLSI is involved in creating these sort of laboratory-based guidelines, they are also part of this endeavor. And so the attempt is to do a survey to assess current practices and then try to identify areas where we could work together towards this sort of uniformity of reporting and interpretation. So please check your emails if you haven't seen this link and this uh, message come through from Jalili. Please check your email. You should have this questionnaire. It doesn't take terribly long to complete, 10 or 20 minutes. And this would be extremely valuable information. And we're asking not only uh, within the United States, but in Canada and globally in Europe and Asia, any uh, group or geographical region doing newborn screening for kids to complete this survey so that we can get as much information as possible to really make this harmonization uh, initiative more successful. And I do want to particularly acknowledge Amy Gavicchio, uh, who is both with APHL and the CDC for her tremendous efforts in crafting um, this survey with the input from the rest of the team and other members of the newborn screening MBSTRN uh, program, and then all uh, the immunology colleagues, uh, both in the United States and uh, in Europe who are participating. I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have them. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Abraham, for your presentation. I will open it up to questions, as she stated. Um, you are free to unmute yourself if you want to ask your question, um, or you can type your question in the chat. I had one question um, for you, though. So I was wondering if there was also a connection with updating the ACMG Act Sheets with this algorithm as well, um, and if you could speak about that. So um, as you know, Jennifer, our first task at hand towards this harmonization effort you know, was to get some data, right, so that we knew what the current practices were. So I see this harmonization effort as a kind of multi-step um, process. Uh, you know, the survey is only the first step uh, of our efforts, and it was a starting phase for us to get data from the newborn screening community to sort of better, for us to better as immunologists and uh, the NBS, uh, APHL, NBS, DRN team to understand, you know, where we could find areas, you know, of consensus to develop the uh, improved or harmonized terminology. And then as uh, you know, second and third and fourth steps to the process would be updating the act sheet, you know, trying to educate each of these communities, you know, we have a responsibility to educate our immunology colleagues, you know, both in the United States and elsewhere, and similarly would look for partnership with APHL and NBSDRN to help with the dissemination of information to the public health community. So I just think we've taken the a half a step towards the first process and we have a few more steps to complete um so and i'm hopeful that we can get there um at least within the next year yes yes are there any other questions Well, thank you again, Dr. Abraham. We will post also the information about the survey on our website. Are we able to share the presentation as well? Yes, uh, you have a copy. I do. I did, I did make a couple of tiny little tweaks today. So I'll just make a fresh 
uh, version of it and send it to you uh, to replace the one I sent you last night. And uh, certainly feel free to share it. And uh, you know, any part of you who has any questions later on uh, can certainly contact you since you're a member of this harmonization effort and you can bring it back to us at our next monthly meeting and we can certainly endeavor to answer any questions that crop up. Yes, thank, thank, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you again uh, for having me. Have a good day. You too. Bye-bye. And I'm going to share my screen one more time. And with that, I'm going to introduce our second speaker for today, Dr. S Sander Halton, um, who's going to be continuing his um, presentation from the MBSTRN um, Research Summit, where he talked about the pharmacological substrate reduction therapy and glutaric um, acidemia type 1. Um, Dr. Halton is a clinical biochemical geneticist with over two years of experience of studying inborn errors of metabolism. Um, he is currently a tenured associate professor of genetics and genomic science with the ICANN School of Medicine on Mount Sinai, and he explores physiopathological mechanisms in, um, dis in disorders of fatty acid oxidation and lysine degradation with the ultimate aim to develop new therapies. So with that said, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hand it over to Dr. Halton. Are you able to... Um, uh, uh, um, share your screen. Yes. Yes, I think so. Um, I hope everybody can see my screen. Yes, we can. And I would like to thank you again for this opportunity to discuss my research. Um, it's going to be, you know, I'm going to shift gears a little bit because I'm not going to talk necessarily about newborn screening. What I will be talking about is about a new treatment opportunity for one of the conditions that's on the recommended uh, uniform screening panel, um, glutaric aciduria type 1. And I'm going to mostly um, you know, reinforce some of the things that I already said on the uh, research topic. But you know, if you would like to interrupt with questions, please go ahead and you know, we can discuss uh, as we go, um, most of you are probably very familiar with inborn errors of metabolism. What I would like to reiterate is that the pathophysiology of these disorders usually includes shortage of an end product of the affected pathway, which you could probably supplement. And on the other hand, there are a lot of inborn errors where the pathophysiology pathology is caused by toxicity of accumulating intermediates. So many of these disorders uh, are treated by preventing to toxicity through substrate reduction. And since this is metabolism, often this involves a dietary intervention. As you will see for glutaric aciduria, that's going to be lysine restriction. And often patients have to prevent metabolic stressors because um, catabolism leads to protein degradation and protein is an endogenous source of lysine. So, you know, we need to prevent these kind of metabolic stressors. But what we are trying to do in our research is we're trying to develop pharmacological ways of substrate reduction. And this is not a new thing. This has been done for other disorders, such as uh, tyrosinemia type 1, another disorder that is uh, included in newborn screening, and that's treated by nitazinone, or many of you may know that under the name orphidin. So let's quickly review lysine degradation. So lysine is an essential amino acid and it's relatively abundant in protein. Um, this pathway is fully mitochondrial and there are nine distinct steps. It's highly active in liver and kidney, which is pretty normal for amino acid metabolism, but otherwise all these enzymes are ubiquitously expressed. So that means that every organ is capable of degrading lysine and that's important because and we know that glutaric aciduria is a neurometabolic disease disorder. So even within the brain, the uh, full pathway for degrading lysine is operational. So this is a clinically relevant pathway because there are several inborn errors of metabolism that occur in lysine degradation. The first one that I would like to highlight is indeed glutaric aciduria type 1. So this is a defect in lysine metabolism, but also hydroxylysine and tryptophan metabolism, as I will point out later. 
and it's caused by this defect in an enzyme called glutaryl CoA dehydrogenase. And indeed, you will accumulate the substrate of these enzymes, glutaryl CoA, that is then converted into alternative metabolites such as glutaric acid and 3-hydroxyglutaric acid. And it's thought that the accumulation of these metabolites is neurotoxic. So glutaric aciduria is categorized as a neurometabolic disorder, and it's characterized by these very specific acute encephalopathic crises that are usually preceded by intercurrent childhood infections, and that then lead to irreversible striatal degeneration. So after such an acute encephalopathic crisis, the patient has lost motor skills and will then suffer from a complex movement disorder. But before such a crisis, the development is usually uh, completely normal. There are some patients that will also have insidious onset of these symptoms. So this is a rare disease, but as you'll see with other genetic diseases, it can occur quite frequently in some populations. So we know that the Amish community, um, it's about one in 500, and also in Ojibwe Cree in Northern Ontario is even more frequent, one in 235. And then there are other communities such as the Irish traveler, and it shows that people in South Africa that have relatively high carrier rates for a particular mutation. So glutaric aciduria is a treatable disorder, uh, considered a treatable disorder, and therefore it's included in neonatal screening. So currently the treatment consists of three interventions. So patients undergo chronic dietary treatment through the restriction of lysine intake with formulas, sometimes also with arginine fortification. There is carnitin supplementation, which is thought to detoxify the accumulating glutaryl CoA. And then there's the acute emergency treatment, which consists of the aggressive prevention of catabolism, often by uh, emergency room uh, visits. And this is a successful treatment because the incidence of symptomatic GA1 has decreased from more than 90% to approximately 25%. So that means there's still uh, some patients that develop symptoms. And then there are these previously unrecognized chronic manifestations that uh, are a growing concern and that may require long-term management. So ultimately, um, GA1 is treatable, but there is intense efforts of the caregiver, patient, and medical professional, and uh, treatment is not perfect. So with our research, we try to come up with alternative uh, strategies, and we hope that we can improve on this treatment. There's one more disease where this could be useful for, that's uh, a candidate disease for newborn screening, paradox-independent epilepsy. Um, this is also a defect in lysine metabolism caused by this deficiency of ALDH7A1. And the accumulation of the metabolite here is also toxic, and it leads, among other things, to inactivation of uh, vitamin B6, which is an important cofactor for many enzymes that function in the brain and neurotransmitter metabolism. And that's why this is also a neurometabolic disorder. It's characterized by very severe seizures that occur very early on, sometimes even before birth. And these seizures are prolonged, last for several minutes, and they can only be treated by large daily doses of pyridoxin. It's a rare disorder, similar to GA1, about 1 in 100,000 individuals. And increasingly, it has been realized that although you can treat the seizures with pyridoxin, neurological problems such as developmental delay and intellectual disability still occurs. So now there's lots of research still going on on this. People are recommending that we uh, treat these patients not only with pyridoxin, but also through lysine reduction. So again, substrate reduction therapy is probably going to be useful here in this disease. And then it's interesting to realize that there are actually other inborn errors of metabolism that occur in this pathway that are actually considered non-diseases. So we have hyperlysinemia, which is caused by mutations in AASS. And we have two aminoadipic, two oxoadipic aciduria that is caused by mutations in DHTKD1. And both are considered biochemical phenotypes with questionable clinical significance. So they're probably not harmful and um, are non-diseases. And this is important um, because non-disease genes are, could represent ideal pharmacological targets. Because when you inhibit such an enzyme, if it, you would then uh, hypothesize that that will not cause disease. 
And this is not something that we came up with. This has been um, recognized uh, early on and is described here in the physician's guide uh, for uh, inborn for treatment of these inborn errors of metabolism. So they're conditions that can be diagnosed through biochemical and genetic methods. So they re represent true inborn errors of metabolism that are considered not harmful. But to make things more complicated, initially they were often diagnosed through metabolic screening in individuals displaying non-specific neurological disease. But then the causality between the disease and the metabolic defect is thought to be unlikely for a couple of reasons. For example, in many of the families, healthy siblings have been found with the same biochemical defect. Um, sometimes apparently healthy cases were identified through neonatal screening. And then upon follow-up, um, other genetic causes were identified that better explain the disease. Sometimes people have tried dietary interventions such as lysine restrictions, and that was not beneficial. And if you study these patients in detail, you will see that very often they have non-specific symptoms. And you know that then increases the likelihood that these associations were all made through ascertainment or sampling bias. So we think there's good evidence that ASS and DHTKD1 represent safe drug targets in humans. So that brings me to the goal of this project. The goal of this project is to develop a small molecule drug for treatment of glutaric aciduria by substrate reduction. And we hope that such a small molecule could ultimately substitute all the current treatment modalities. So substrate reduction therapy will divert the toxic accumulation of the GCD8 substrate into a less harmful accumulation of any of these enzymes upstream in the pathway. But of course, we want to inhibit the enzymes which we think are safe, so we started out actually not looking at ASS, but looking at DHTKD1. So our initial hypothesis was that we can divert the toxic accumulation of glutaryl QA into less harmful accumulation of two amino and two oxoadipic acid by inhibition of DHTKD1. Ultimately, after a lot of studies, we had to conclude that the efficacy of inhibition of DHTKD1 was probably going to be too limited to be uh, clinically relevant. So we had to switch over to our other targets, um, ASS. So we had to change our hypothesis. And now we are thinking that we can divert the toxic accumulation of glutaryl CoA into less harmful accumulation of lysine through inhibition of ASS. And I would like to point out here that ASS is probably also a good target to treat paradox independent epilepsy because it's indeed upstream of ALDH7A1. So the objective now is to identify small molecule inhibitors for ASS. And this is probably a good point to point out that lysine, although the major source of GCDH substrate, it's not an exclusive source of GCDH substrate because hydroxylysine feeds into the pathway just downstream of ASS and this is an ubiquitous pathway that probably also is functional within the brain. And then there's tryptophan degradation that feeds into the pathway over here. And this pathway is probably limited to liver and kidney, so maybe not contributing to substrate accumulation in, uh, in the brain. Um, and then there is, some of you may have heard of a pipicolate pathway, but uh, this is kind of an enigmatic pathway. And at this point, we believe the contribution to the production of GCDH substrate is small or absent. So let me give you a little bit more detail about uh, the ASS enzyme. It's an interesting enzyme. It's mito mitochondrial enzyme and it's bifunctional, which means that it has two different enzymatic domains. The lysine 2 oxoglutarate reductase domain and the sacropene dehydrogenase domain. And this is actually reflected in the types of hyperlysinemia that are observed in human cases. So we have the condition uh, known as hyperlysinemia type 1, which is caused by a combined defect of the uh, LOR and SDH domain or an isolated LOR defect. And these patients have mostly accumulation of only lysine. And then there is hyperlysinemia type 2, and that's caused by an isolated defect in the sacropene dehydrogenase domain 
And these patients have, in addition to hypolysinemia, they also have sacropinuria. So they accumulate this sacropine metabolite. And that may not necessarily be a good thing because there's some indication from animal studies that sacropine is a mitochondrial uh, toxin. So at this point of time, um, we are trying to develop inhibitors for this first domain, the lysin 2 oxoglutarate reductase domain. So we started out with validation of this approach in a cell line model. And for that, we're currently using CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing because it's very easy to knock out any gene of interest and see what the biochemical consequences of that is. And we can make, in addition to making single knockouts, as we did here for glutamyl coa dehydrogenase, we can make double knockouts and knocking out both GCDH as well as our target ASS. And here you can see the validation of these knockout experiments with immunoblotting. And you see that if you make the knockout, the protein is essentially gone. So really creating a good you know, disease model. So what does that do for the metabolite accumulation? So first here, we're looking at the accumulation of glutaryl carnitine. And you can see that if you knock out GCDH, you uh, create a model for glutaryl type 1 because the uh, cell lines are all characterized by accumulation of glutaryl carnitine. So C5DC, the marker that we also use in newborn screening, is accumulating in the pellets of the cells. And if you then generate uh, sequentially a double knockout cell line so that both miss the GCDH as well as the AASS uh, protein, you can see that that glutaryl carnitine accumulation decreases essentially in all the different clones that we have generated. And you can see that this decrease is approximately fivefold, but it doesn't decrease to the level that we've seen in a wild type or non genetically modified cells. So that's probably because there are other substrates that contribute to this accumulation, such as hydroxylysine. We also looked at lysine in these cell pellets, and there was no change. So then we moved on to validating this approach in our mouse model. And a GA1 mouse model was already generated very early on in the 2000s by Steve Goodman, who did a lot of good work on uh, glutaric aciduria. He is actually the first one to recognize this inborn error of metabolism. So if you knock out the GCDH gene in the mouse, you create an animal model that biochemically is very similar to the human disease with accumulation of glutaric acid and 3-hydroxyglutaric acid. But these mice do not get uh, necessarily uh, sick um, without a trigger. So what you need to do in order to uh, induce a neurological phenotype is that you need to uh, expose these mice to elevated dietary protein or lysine. And then they will have a phenotype that pretty much resembles human GA1. And one of the very prominent things that we've also seen is that they have uh, brain bleeding, so have hemorrhaging within the brain. And then we were able to also purchase a knockout model for ASS. Um, so here you can see the validation. So this is a previously non-reported um, mouse line. So here you can see that indeed the ASS protein is essentially gone, not only in the liver, but also in the brain of these mice. And that then leads to hyperlysinemia. Here you can see plasma lysine levels, which are pretty much within the range that we also uh, see in humans with uh, mutations in ASS. So we then created GCDH is as double knockout mice. And the first thing that I would like to point out here is the weight of the kidney. So kidney disease is one of those long-term complications that uh, investigators are now seeing in patients with glutaric aciduria. And what was also known is that in these GA1 mice, there is an enlarged kidney. And when you generate these double knockout mice, you can see that the kidney weight from increase normalizes basically to whatever is observed in uh, wild type mice. So that's already a good sign. So let's now look at the different biomarkers for butyric aciduria. So we can measure all these biomarkers also in mouse urine and mouse plasma. And here you see glutaric acid excretion in urine. And you see that this is indeed massively increased in the GA1 mouse model. 
that by knocking out ASDS, there is a 4.3 fold decrease in the excretion of glutaric acid in urine. And we can observe parallel decrease in 3-hydroxyglutaric and glutaryl carnitine levels in the urine. And then in plasma, here is C5DC, glutaryl carnitine, the biomarker used for newborn screening, decreased approximately threefold in the ASS GCH double knockout mice. And of course, this all comes at the consequence of hyperlysinemia, because when we knock out ASS, we create hyperlysinemia. And here you can see again that these mice have levels around 1.5 millimolar of lysine in circulating in the plasma. More importantly is, of course, what's happening in the brain, um, because this is where ultimately the disease occurs. So here we're measuring glutaric acid within the brain, and you can see that also within the brain, in the double knockout, there is about a fourfold decrease in glutaric acid. Same holds for 3-hydroxyglutaric acid and 3-hydroxyglutaryl carnitine, which are all decreasing in parallel. And again, we can see here that the lysine levels are increased in the brain. So we are doing some uh, studies to also see if um, this ASS knockout can prevent clinical disease in this mouse model, but these are studies that are still ongoing. So I cannot really um, give you a strong conclusion there. What I do would like to point out here is that you can see um, the hemorrhaging in these GA1 mice um, upon high lysine exposure. And we so far we have only looked at three different GCDH ASS double knockout mice, and we've never seen any of these uh, brain bleeding in these double knockout mice. So to conclude this part of my presentation, uh, ASS is the main source of GCDH substrates, not only in the periphery, but also in the brain, as we have shown in our mouse model. Um, we do know that if we knock out ASS in the GA1 mouse model, the metabolite accumulation does not reach control levels. And that is because there are alternative sources of GCDH substrates. I have pointed out that hydroxylysine degradation is very likely the culprit here because this pathway is ubiquitous. So it's also active within the brain, but indeed in the periphery, um, tryptophan degradation, which occurs in liver and kidney can play a role in the production of GCDA substrate. And the picolate pathway, we don't think plays a significant role, but it's something that deserves uh, attention in our future research. So we believe that pharmacological inhibition of ASS may represent an attractive strategy to treat GA1. So we are working on that right now. And initially in our early work, we started out uh, with virtual screening. So there was no, um, yeah, we had no real crystal structure of our um, protein of interest, which was the, AS, the LOR domain of ASS. So we made a molecular model. And with that molecular model, we did a virtual screening and we selected 127 inhibitor candidates. And from this, we only um, found one low affinity inhibitor with a, well, an IC50, that's not very impressive. So really indicating we would need to have a different strategy to find good inhibitors of uh, the uh, LOR domain of ASS. So we, over the last year, we performed a high throughput screening. And I did that at the ICCD Longwood Screening Facility in Harvard. We had developed an assay to measure this LOR enzyme. And it has a, um, you know, it's, it's an excellent assay for screening. And using that assay, we screened over 100,000 molecules from two commercial libraries, and we identified 142 candidate inhibitors. Of these 142, 82 were selected for a cherry pick, and about 50% of these molecules were confirmed inhibitors, of which the best inhibitors had an IC50 of around 2 micromolar. So 10 molecules were selected for repurchase, and in general, the IC50s matched uh, our cherry pick results quite well. Um, at least four repurchase molecules had activity in an orthogonal cell-based uh, model, which is something I will show in the next slide. And of these two 
two are very promising leads and two are considered backup structures. So here you see some of the data. So these were the molecules that we repurchased. And you can see that all of them are able to inhibit the activity of the LOR enzyme of the AASS uh, protein. Some of these are now considered lead molecules. We already did some structure activity relationship where we order uh, analogs of our initial hits and we see if changes in the molecule improves or uh, makes the inhibition worse. And um, one of these analogs here, the analog of C5 is now considered lead four. And you can see that this one actually has an IC50 that's lower than one micromolar. And that's um, you know, pretty good at this point, something we can work with. One essential step is actually to see that your molecules are actually what you think they are. And one way to do that is not only by repurchasing, but also by resynthesizing the molecule uh, anew. And here you can see that the resynthesis of this lead number four gives a molecule that actually has exactly the same IC50. So that's um, good evidence that uh, we're actually here working on, uh, on some um, good st structures. So here I would like to share with you um, our cell line data. So what we are doing is we are treating these GA1 cell line model with our uh, ASS inhibitors. And we're measuring again, glutaryl carnitine accumulation within the cell pellet. And you can see that for all four lead molecules, we can dose dependently decrease glutaryl carnitine accumulation. So this is formal proof that pharmacological inhibition of the LOR domain of ASS can decrease glutaryl carnitine uh, accumulation in a GA1 cell line model. Um, we have also uh, worked on the crystal structure of our protein of interest. So what we're doing here is we took the LOR domain, expressed it as an isolated protein, and we're able to solve the first crystal structure of this human enzyme. And we've recently published that. And I think more importantly, at this point of time, we also have co-crystal structures with two of our lead molecules. And what's interesting is that initially I actually had expected that a lot of our inhibitors um, would be uh, targeting the active site of the uh, enzyme. But that's not what we're finding. It actually seems that uh, most of the molecules, or at least the, the two that we have uh, co-crystallized with LOR, are binding to a site that is not the active site. So it's actually an allosteric site. So probably an inhibitory allosteric site. And at this point, we're thinking that allosteric regulation of this protein is actually an important regulatory mechanism of uh, lysine metabolism. So our research is still continuing. So we're doing all kinds of validations and we're trying to improve our lead molecules um, our studies in the GA1 mouse model, in particular, the high lysine exposure are continuing because we really want to show that inhibition of ASS can also prevent clinical disease. And what I would also like to start is to see if we can start exploring ASS as a new treatment for pyridoxine-dependent epilepsy. And also here, we can think of using a mouse model because recently, um, a mouse model for pyridoxine if a pyridoxin dependent epilepsy was reported in human molecular genetics. So I'd like, like to acknowledge my uh, collaborators, Bob DeVita and my collaborators from the Department of Pharmacological Sciences at Mount Sinai, and my postdoc, Xiao Leandro, who did a lot of the work on this project. And of course, over the years, we have received um, um, grants from NIH, in particular, um, NICHD, R, R3, and R21 funds. And I would like to thank you for your attention, and I hope that you have some questions, and um, yeah, maybe I can answer those. Thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Houghton, for your talk. Um, um, we're glad to have you here at this call today. Um, I know we are running short on time. We have um, our call ends at three. If there's any burning questions for Dr. Houghton, um, feel free to unmute yourself or you can um, put the question in the chat.
I am going to, since we are running short on time, I'm going to move on. Thank you again, Dr. Houghton, for your presentation. I'm going to move on to the um, a few announcements. Um, if uh, Kashia is on the line, Kashia, do you mind um, making your announcement about the uh, for the APHL? Um, sure. Um, so, uh, first announcement: um, the uh, registration for the newborn screening symposium is still open. Um, you can register on the conference site. Um, you can also still register for CEUs as well. Um, and you would just do that by going on the site as well. Um, next slide. So we uh, recent, recently released the MPS2 uh, resources and tool, um, tools publication. Um, so that publication has been sent out to the community but it is also available on APHL.org and newsteps.org. Um, programs can use this um, tool to help with implementing um, MPS2, and they can also um, use this tool to communicate with st uh, key stakeholders regarding the implementation of um, MPS2. Next slide. Okay, um, and this is a reminder for state programs to please update your new steps um, data repository state profile. Um, if you are planning to, to screen for MPS2 or if you are um, implementing MPS2 soon, please, to up, up, please update that as well. Um, if you have any questions regarding um, the new steps repository, please reach out to Sarah McCasson. Next slide. Um, we also uh, recently sent out an uh, email regarding the Peer Network Resource Center. Um, so we do fund the Missouri Newborn Screening Program to serve as a Peer Network Resource Center. If you um, are interested in learning more about um, screening for lysosomal disorders or SMA, um, MPS2, and they're going to be screening for XALD soon, um, if you're interested in learning about any of those disorders, please reach out to me or please reach out to Patrick Hopkins at the Missouri Lab. And then finally, um, if you need any other new disorders assistance, um, so if you are looking um, for technical assistance or training, if you're looking to visit another laboratory to learn more about their process, um, for any new disorder, um, please feel free to reach out to me. And I think that's it, Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you, Kashia. And just uh, a few updates. I'm sorry we did not get to the state updates today, but there's a few date updates on the NBSTN side of things. Um, we had our 2022 research summit that um, was last week, um, last uh, Wednesday and Thursday. Feel free to go on our website. You can catch the replay or you can go to our YouTube channel and you can catch the replay of all the speakers that we had. Um, also check out our MBS Trion podcast. Um, episode 15 is Genomics England, the role of genomic sequencing of newborns. And it is with um, Dr. David Bick. So please check that out. You can find that also on our website or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And um, finally, we are changing the time, the date of our um, call for November. Instead of the first Thursday, we're going to have it on the first Tuesday. It's going to be on November 1st um, at 2 p.m. Eastern, so everybody can attend the ACHDNC meeting, which will be on that Thursday. Um, we On that day, we will have another guest lecture. Um, we will have... Um, Dr. Betty on, he will be um, uh, continuing his presentation that he um, spoke about on the network meeting about mitochondrial pyruvate dehydrogenase complex deficiencies. So um, thank you again for meeting, uh, for attending this meeting. You can always check us out on any of our social media channels. Check out if you colleagues are interested in it, please let them know that these meetings are available on the YouTube channel. And if you have any feedback, please send myself or Dr. Amy Brower an email if you're interested in these conversations that we've had during the past um, couple 
months where we've had presentations. Let us know what you like, what you don't like. Um, if you have speaker suggestions, let us know that as well. So thank you again. Thank you for staying an extra couple minutes um, longer. And I wish you guys a good October. And I hope to see some of you at the APHL meeting in a couple of weeks. So thank you.